And, and so he's going to go in and do the, just sit with the family, and then when she dies, to perform the ritual of, of kind of taking the pulse and, and checking the breathing and pronouncing her dead. And you'll hear what happens after this um, with the mother. This, this, her daughter has just died. So here we go. So I quietly went into the room and I said, I need to examine Brianna one last time. And then I performed the ritual. I felt for the absence of a pulse. I put my stethoscope on her chest and I listened for a full 60 seconds for the absence of a heartbeat. And I said to her mother, I'm so sorry for your loss. And I noted silently the time of death. And as I was getting ready to leave the room, I turned to her and I said, is there anything I can do for you? And she paused and said, could you pray with me? And I hesitated because I'm a lapsed Jew from New Jersey and I don't really pray and I don't really believe in God. And frankly, pretending to pray in the face of a dead child seemed like the absolutely wrong thing to do. But then there in that moment, it dawned on me that this wasn't about me. Brianna's mother needed me to be the doctor that she saw me as, and this was the opportunity for me to be the doctor that I wanted to be. And so there in that room, lit just by silent glowing monitors, I had the one truly beautiful moment for myself in medicine, where a stranger held my hands and we stood over the body of her daughter, and I closed my eyes when she did, and when she started to speak, words of a prayer that I had only heard a few times before somehow came forth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Many people say they don't believe, and maybe in their normal life they don't. But it's in these kinds of situations um, where you find out um, that maybe that there is a spark of faith, or even desire to have faith where there is none. Jesus said you have to have faith as small as a mustard seed. Some people are in traditions where they say the really unhelpful thing, like this person would have lived if you had had faith. You would be healed if you had faith. You just haven't prayed enough. Jesus says mustard seed. Now, you want to know what a mustard seed sounds like? It's that. The smallest seed. I'm a lapsed Jew from New Jersey. I don't pray and I don't believe. But our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's often at the worst and hardest places in life where your, your, your actual theology comes out. Um, you pray in, in the ruins. Um, in Psalm 31, there is a verse uh, 21, blessed, is the, blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his love in a besieged city. Not the wonders of his love on a cruise ship. The wonders of his love in a city where the siege works have been built against it. The food is running out, the water is running out, and there is no hope. The wonders of his love in a besieged city. That hospital room was a besieged city. And there's sort of this, as he says, the one truly beautiful moment in medicine, in his career, where he was given to pray. By the way, this is why in our tradition and many Christian traditions we use liturgy. We're teaching you to pray when your own words fail. He didn't know how to pray. But when called upon, he had heard a prayer before a few times, and that was enough. I can't tell you how many times, and any minister who visits hospitals will tell you this, or nursing homes, you'll pray with people whose minds are no longer here, but you start the Lord's Prayer, and it's right there. So we're teaching you to pray today for the end of your life. So next podcast, this is Heavyweight with Jonathan Goldstein, who's hilarious and wonderful, and um, these stories are always about going back to a point in your life where something meaningful happened, but then you lost the thread. 
you had a meaningful encounter in high school with somebody and you haven't talked to them in 30 years and you always wondered what happened to them. Or you, um, you had a friend who was really close to you for a certain point in your life and then they disappeared. Or you had a chance encounter that um, you just it transformed everything about you and you've never been able to thank that person. So he goes back to those really important moments in life and has conversations with people. And in this one, it's with John Green, who you can see in the lower right. John Green has written a bunch of books, probably most known for Fault in Our Stars, which was made into a movie. Um, John Green uh, um, went to an Episcopal college called Kenyon College, and um, he thought that he might want to go into ordained ministry. And as a test, he signed up for something called CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education, which is where they put you in the hardest situations in hospital rooms and emergency rooms, and you're sort of a chaplain, and they throw you into the deep end. And um, if you want to hear some stories, talk to somebody who's been through CPE. And he's there, and a three-year-old comes in with burns over most of his body due to an accident at their farm. And because of how horrible that experience is, he decides... He quits, and he doesn't go into ministry. He's like, I cannot handle this. And his faith after that point is really hanging on by a thread. So the child was three. He was 20 when that happened. And now, uh, almost 20 years later, Jonathan Goldstein is able to find this kid. His name is Nick. And it's during the pandemic, so they have the Zoom conversation. You'll hear their Zoom conversation. Um, and so John has wondered his whole life what happened to this child. Pretty sure he didn't make it. Um, it turns out he's, Nick is a devout Baptist. He went to Bible college. He's now getting a master's degree, wants to go into ministry. And Nick says that this burning experience is what brought him and his family into a deeper relationship with Christ. Right before what, you, what you're about to hear, John has asked Nick, knowing that terrible things can happen, how do you square that with your faith? And you'll hear his answer. And I just, I'll give a, just a little caveat. Um, you may not like Nick's answer. This is a question people have. How do I square the bad things in life with a belief in a loving God? And you've probably heard trite answers to that question. You've maybe heard unhelpful answers to that question. And I would say, hold off on evaluating Nick's response to that question. Just know that it's his experience, and he's speaking authentically from his experience. As someone who's making, um, trying to make sense of a deeply personal and lifelong difficulty. So I just say that. Um, and this clip is five minutes and 48 seconds, okay? Just so you're prepared. It took a quite a long time for me to reconcile that with God, and I spent a while quite angry. It's Nick talking. I guess the way I look at it, it was a harsh mercy. Um, theologically speaking, for those who love God, everything is supposed to work for their good. And if you, if you look at it in that light, the world definitely makes more sense. Um, the Lord does allow some evil. But in the end, the evil works for good. And Nick sees a lot of good in his life. It's the host. He's grateful for his parents who stood by him all throughout his recovery. His grandfather who tirelessly combed through stores searching for a lotion that might offer relief. The teachers who helped him in and out of his pressure garments. You know, the Lord put certain people in my life for a reason. I grew up in public schools. And, and yeah, there were some people there that didn't quite understand why I looked the way I looked, but the community did everything they could to educate the kids around me as to why I had scar tissue, why I had plastic face mask on. I think that it's so easy to be merely angry after that. Um, and I think I might be merely angry, uh, to be honest. Um, I might be merely angry if it happened to my kid. I might be merely angry if it happened to me. Um, you know, it's just, you know, the devil's always trying to tempt you and draw you astray. And, and I think that's one of the things he uses against me is, oh, how could this happen to you? You know, why would, 
such a merciful and loving God let this happen to you? You know, and if you look at it like that, then, you know, the devil's won. You know, I, I don't I don't usually think about it in, in uh, terms of good and evil, really. Um, but a lot of life is a battle against despair because I, I have serious uh, mental health problems, Nick. Despair, nihilism, hopelessness, they're forms of this, this lie that my brain sometimes tries to tell me about being a person, being alive, consciousness, that it's all empty, it's all meaningless. Um, and I have to find ways of, of holding on to hope. Good. The sadness and the, you know, the desperation about it, I don't know that that'll ever go away entirely. I struggle with, you know, feeling down sometimes. But then again, I, I don't want to be that lonely person sequestered in a house somewhere. So, you know, I'm going to move on and I'm going to just be the person I want to be. So in answer to John's question, has it been a good life? The answer is yes, because Nick is determined to make it one. From what the doctor said, I thought, I thought that, that you were likely to die. And mm -hmm. most of the last, you know, 18 years, I, I, I thought that, I thought that you had died. And, um, and, and so I would, I would, I would, uh, pray for you every night and for your family. And I wanted to get, I wanted to get in touch with you if I could to say, that I, I think of you often, and I and I hope that's okay. I hope it's I, I hope it's okay um, that I pray for you and your family. If it's not, I'm, I'll stop. You know, I'm just I'm glad that somebody was always praying for me, because there are definitely were definitely times where it was necessary. Without doubt, Nick is grateful for John's prayers, but overall, I get the feeling that some things, some crucial things, are in place in Nick's life. His family is close-knit. His life has purpose. He's secure in his faith. But he can tell John is struggling. To him, John's not this famous writer, but someone who came to him heavy-hearted. So as to John's prayers, Nick points out someone else who might have benefited from them. John. Praying for me, I, I really hope that's helped keep the dialogue between you and the Lord fluid and going. Um, you know... I never thought of it that way, Nick, but it is true that on the days when I prayed for nothing else and felt no real meaning in, in prayer, that I still prayed for you and for your family, and that, that was a point of connection. At a time when religion stopped making sense to John, at a time when he felt like he couldn't reasonably pray for himself or his family, he still hungered for something that went beyond reason. And in those moments, there was Nick. Blessed be the Lord where he has shown me the wonders of his love in a besieged city. God often hears prayers, always hears prayers, um, whether they come with a little bit of faith or, whether they're hang or, um, or a lot, whether you feel sort of on fire for the Lord or maybe hanging on by a thread. Um, and I say that because so many people, I think, again, their implied theology is that God wants so much from them. God wants a memorized Bible. God wants perfect church attendance. If you could learn a little Greek and Hebrew, it wouldn't kill anyone. <laughs> if you could have all your doctrinal points in order, 
God wants all these things of you, and frankly, you're not doing a good job. That's everybody's baseline, I think. And what I love about these stories and find so meaningful is that one is, as he said, a lapsed Jew from New Jersey who doesn't believe in God, and the other is a person who barely believes in God. But they pray. Both of them pray. And those prayers are some of the most meaningful and powerful experiences of their whole lives. I, um, I think uh, the, the story with, um, with John Green, uh, what he realizes in that conversation um, is the only connection that remained in his life to God for decades was the fact that he felt compelled to pray for this boy and his family. There was still that, that line that was open all the time. I wonder how many agnostics and atheists keep a little secret line open. <laughs> you see this with George Bailey. I'm looking at you, Jesse Lee, your favorite movie of all time, It's a Wonderful Life. Frank Capra's beautiful post-World War II film starring um, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, where he is at the end of his rope and he prays on that bridge in the snowstorm, God, if you're up there. These kinds of prayers to me are so raw and so real. And I would put them before you, again, as people who clearly are interested in the spiritual life. I mean, you got up and came to church. Nobody made you. Maybe somebody made you, but probably not. <laughs> probably not. Um, so there's some spiritual hunger there. And there's some picture in your mind of what it means to be a spiritual person. But I point these two examples. These are spiritual people. And they're people with spirits. And this is a real account of their prayer. Um, and they're real because they're connected to need. Um, and, uh, and they pray for very specific people and very specific things. And if I could offer you something in your own prayer life, it is to connect with these places of need. And really, I don't even have to tell you that. You probably are already doing these places because where the need is, that's probably already where you're talking to God. But if you're not, I encourage you, as Stevie Wonder said, to have a talk with God. The reason this is hard for some people is because we find denial so wonderful. I see this sometimes in ministry after I've had a conversation with someone about a hard thing in their life, and I'll say, well, what is the one thing I can be in prayer for about that? And nine times out of 10, the request is for peace. And I wanna grab them by their lapels and say, no! Why don't you ask me to pray for the thing be fixed? Why don't you ask for prayer um, for a, a resolution to the estranged relationship or a, um, a reconciliation where it needs to be. I mean, um, don't worry, I will never grab your lapels um, in my office. But uh, these, when, when John Green was praying, he was praying that everything would go, be okay with Nick. Not that he would have peace about it. So as I say, like connect with what you actually need, connect with what you want. Grown-ups are good at stifling what they want because you were told as a child to not want. You know, don't be selfish. And so somebody will ask you what you want for your birthday. I don't know. You know, that's why we all get Amazon gift cards. <laughs> but get in touch with what you want. Get in touch with what you want. What do you want from God? And ask God for that thing. I don't know what the answer will be, but at least come into reality with yourself and with God about the thing that you want. Um, many of us are in a besieged city, but we pray like we're on a cruise to the Bahamas. God, we just want to thank you for this beautiful day. What do you want? The other thing I see that's sort of possibly a form of denial, but really it's, to me it's a very touching, um, it genders a lot of pathos in me uh, when I, we, I'm in a group setting and I'll ask for prayer requests. You, and you've seen this if you've been to a small group or a Bible study at the end, there's like a prayer time. Like, what do we pray for? Let's go around them. And everybody has prayers for other people. 
Pray for Aunt Sally. Pray for my mom. Pray for whoever. Very rarely will somebody say, you know what? I'm having the hardest time getting out of bed in the morning. Would you pray for me? Or I am so stuck in a procrastination loop and I feel paralyzed. I'm so far behind in my work and the shame is crushing me that it makes me even more stuck. Nobody ever says those things. I'm inviting you to acknowledge the reality that you're not on a cruise ship, but you live in a besieged city. You won't find out the wonders of God's love in a besieged city if you're constantly pretending you're not in a besieged city. So, specific things. What you actually want. Pray from that place. Because if you don't, your implied theology is that God doesn't care and can't help. But, what if God could help? And what if God was there in the besieged city? That's where I want to stop. But I do want to invite questions, if you dare. (laughs) Thoughts. Where is this landing with you?